It's time to build a $1,500 gaming PC build for 2020, featuring this, NVIDIA's brand new RTX 3080. Let's jump straight into it. Now, as always, I'm gonna kick things off by installing the RAM, SSD, and CPU into the motherboard. In order to keep this build around the $1,500 budget, I've gone for MSI's B550 MAG Tomahawk board. It's got plenty of great features, including overclocking support, a couple of M.2 slots, and of course, room for our CPU choice, which is AMD's Ryzen 5 3600X. Now, I'm gonna test this properly later, but this shouldn't bottleneck the 3080 at higher resolutions. 1080p, it might have a bit of an impact, but 1440p and 4K, you should be good. Installing the CPU is as easy as pulling up the retention arm and then lining up the gold triangle on the processor with the corresponding triangle on our motherboard. The arm is then gonna slide back down into place and that really is pretty much it. The next thing I'm gonna do is pop in our storage today. This is an NVMe drive from Seagate that comes in at a really great price point and is gonna provide some nice quick storage for today's system. We're gonna install this under the M.2 heatsink on the motherboard and yes for this you will need a teeny tiny little screwdriver. Before we screw the heatsink back down you need to remove this little plastic cover and it will secure down into place just like so. Finally then the last stage of our motherboard assembly so to speak is to install the RAM. This is 16 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance Pro 3000 megahertz. To install the RAM, pull back the clip on the second and fourth DIMM slot and align the notch on the memory with the notch on the motherboard. Even pressure to both sides and they're going to clip into place nice and easily. And we're then going to install the motherboard assembly into the case. Specifically, this is Corsair's new IQ4000X RGB with three RGB fans at the front and this really nice tempered glass side panel it ticks all the boxes at a pretty reasonable price today. Wow that's like a really nice little touch we've got Corsair's new yellow colour kind of like tagged onto the dust filter and the same on the captive thumb screws that's a really neat little touch. We're next going to spin the case all the way round and as always grab our case accessory box. Inside of this, we've got all the screws we're gonna need, as well as some really nice kind of Velcro cable management straps. Conveniently, this case has already got all the standoffs we're gonna need pre-installed, which allows us to slide our motherboard straight into place, securing it down with these included screws. Next up then, I wanna go ahead and install the CPU cooler, but first we need to pop in the power supply. This is Corsair's CX750M, which don't worry, does meet Nvidia's new recommendations and guidelines for powering the RTX 3080. This particular unit is semi-modular, which means we are gonna need to plug in a couple of cables. The first is our dual six plus two pin PCIe power connector. And the last one is a bunch of SATA power harnesses. We're then gonna spin the case around and screw the power supply in fan facing downwards. I'm then gonna take this opportunity to install our 24 pin motherboard power connector, followed by our four plus four pin CPU power connector. Now that the power supply is in, we can go ahead and pop in the CPU cooler before finally installing the graphics card. This here is Corsair's brand new H100i Elite Capellix. Now, for those of you that don't know, Capellix is Corsair's proprietary RGB technology, which gives you really, really bright LEDs. So I'm excited to see just how good these look. The installation method for this on an AMD CPU is super simple. Take this AMD AM4 bag and grab these two brackets. We're then gonna replace the pre-installed brackets, which slide off super duper easily with these AMD ones. And we're then also gonna pop this little D bracket and a retainer screw through each side of the cooler. And the cooler is gonna fasten onto the pre-installed mounting brackets just like so. And it's also a good idea to install our radiator fans before fastening the radiator into the case. While we're here, I'm also gonna replace the top plate on our AIO CPU cooler to better match the color scheme of this build. The next step today then, before we finally install the graphics card, is to plug up some of our wires and our cabling. First up is our HD audio connector, which makes the headphone and mic jacks on the top of the case functional. 
This goes to the bottom left of the motherboard, just like so. We're next gonna pop our USB 3 connector in. This powers the USB 3 port and is keyed, so we'll only go in one way around. The next cable on the list today is our JFP1 connectors. These are our power and reset buttons, hard drive indicator, LED, and all that good stuff. These go to the bottom right of the motherboard, and I'll pop a diagram on screen now to make the fiddly process all in all a little bit easier. Finally, the last cable today then is the USB 3.1 Gen 2 connector, which goes to the right-hand side of the motherboard and powers our USB-C port. Now that the cables are all done, it's finally time to install this. NVIDIA's latest and greatest RTX 3080. This Founders Edition card is a beast. With NVIDIA's new super compact power connector, their dual axial flow cooler, which basically divides the GPU up into two zones, alongside a load more power than last generation, and of course, those second gen RT cores for supercharged ray tracing performance. We're gonna take a deep dive into the performance a bit later, so hang tight for that. Installing the graphics card is super easy. We need to remove the second and third PCIe slot covers, and push this clip back on our PCIe slot. All that's left to do then is plug up our graphics card using this dual eight pin to NVIDIA 12 pin adapter, and then whack both the case side panels on before booting this machine up to see how it looks, but more importantly, how it performs. Roll the montage. Okay then, now you've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up and the build process from start to finish, let's dive in and see exactly how it performs. I've tested eight of the most popular and some of the most demanding titles out there to give you a really even picture in some of your favourite titles. First up is GTA 5 and at high settings, you're looking at an average frames per second of 90 with a 90 and 99th percentile of 76 and 69. So even your lowest frame rates are in that 69 region, which is fantastic in terms of performance. And of course, visually at 4K high settings, the game looks unbelievable. Next up is Apex Legends, of course the latest season 6 of the Battle Royale title that, much like Call of Duty's Warzone, has taken the gaming world by storm just a little bit. With an average frames per second of 95 and 90 and 99th percentile results of 88 and 85, once again the game performs exceptionally well. And this RTX 3080 is really flexing its muscles and also not being too affected by the 3600X CPU, which is of course on the slightly cheaper end for an RTX 3080 pairing. Next up then, we've got Call of Duty's Warzone. Here at 4K high settings with of course ray tracing disabled because it doesn't actually do anything in the free Warzone Battle Royale. And you look at an average frames per second of 96 with 91 and 88 frames per second respectively for the 90th and 99th percentile results. That means basically you've got a minimum of 88 frames per second, 99% of the time at 4K high settings, which is bonkers. So yes, if you want 150 frames per second, 1440p medium or high, it's gonna work absolutely fine. Next up then, we've got a bit of Forza Horizon 4. At 4K ultra settings, the ultra preset, uh, running the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, you look at an average frames per second of 130 with 117 and 114 frames per second for your 90th and 99th percentile results respectively. For a racing game, you're looking 45 to 50 FPS is a very acceptable figure because you haven't got the high action scenes that you have uh, in say a first person shooter like Call of Duty's Warzone. So 130 FPS is gonna cover you more than nicely and you literally do not need any more frames per second in Forza Horizon 4. Next up then is Overwatch, another title where the frames per second, if I had a chart, would quite literally be off it. With an average FPS of 223, uh, with 90 and 99th percentile results in the region of 193 and 163 FPS, meaning the vast, vast majority of the time your frame rate is never going below 163, 
Now, that's just unbelievable. At 4K epic settings, the game looks fantastic as you would expect. And these kind of esports level frame rates are sure to please even the most frame hungry gamers out there. Talking of which, CSGO, we're seeing an average frames per second at 4K ultra settings of 211 frames per second, which I think is kind of like the cap for CSGO, as it sits pretty much exactly where my previous 3080 build, linked in the card section now, uh, also sat at 4K ultra settings. Battlefield 5 is the penultimate title on my benchmarking lineup today, and here at 4K high settings with RTX and DLSS enabled, you look at an average frames per second of 75, with 64 and 57 FPS for those 90 and 99th percentile results. Once again, the game looks stunning, and ray tracing really flexes its muscles here. The particles and the fire and the explosions look fantastic, and to think that when ray tracing first came out, you were lucky to get 40 frames per second in Battlefield 5 at 1440p or 4K, this is a fantastic set of results. And of course, take ray tracing off, you're looking well over 130 frames per second. Finally then today, we've got a bit of Fortnite, and I tested this game with three different settings variations, so hang tight, don't go anywhere. First up is 4K high settings with RTX and DLSS enabled on the performance mode specifically, and you look at an average of 75 FPS with 63 and 51 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. But James, 51 FPS on the lowest end is a bit low. Okay, granted, let's tune it down to 1440p, same DLSS and RTX settings, and here you see an increase to 87 frames per second for the average with 74 and 68 for the 90th and 99th percentile results. But James, that's still not enough. Well, not to worry, taking it back up to 4K, but turning RTX off and enabling DLSS, which basically just gives you some extra free frame rate. It's a bit more complicated than that, but nevertheless, here we're looking at an average of 170 FPS with 90 and 99th percentile results of 132 and 107 respectively. DLSS, of course, renders the game out at, say, 1440p and then uses AI to upscale to 4K, giving you the frame rate of 1080 or 1440p, but the visual performance of 4K. What's not to love? With that being said, though, I think that pretty much wraps it up, not only for the benchmark section today, but the whole video. Don't worry, there will be lots more content coming your way very soon, so make sure to drop a like rating and get subscribed if you aren't already. Thank you very much for watching, though, and as always, we'll see you in the next Geek A What video.